Well, good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. God is good. And shalom. God's peace. We thank him for another day, another Sunday. He has gathered us together that we might honor and worship him and hear uh, his word today that will bless us and prepare us for our journey uh, through life's situations and circumstances. Amen? Amen? God is so good. So let us pray. Father, we thank you. We honor you. We give you glory and praise this morning because you are so good. You are much worthy to be praised. We lift up the name of Jesus high above the earth, Father, so that we can draw all men unto you. In the name of Jesus, bless each ear that hears this word today, Father. Bring encouragement and strength, Father, to the soul and the minds of those, Father, who are hungering and thirsting for your righteousness. Help us to be mindful of our walk with you, Father God, our life that we live, that we do it for your glory, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of the kingdom, Father. Help us to be kingdom-minded, knowing that all things come from you, Father. We are to put our love, our trust, and our faith in you, Father God. Let you be the ruler, the leader, the guide, and the guard of our lives. And we'll give you glory, we'll give you praise in everything we do to the end of our days, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen, amen. We're going to talk about living your purpose. Um, a lot of times our lives are filled with a lot of daily challenges. Has anybody been challenged this past week? Uh, I think everybody's hands are to what I know mine has. Uh, I've had some challenges. And um, some of them come with an expectation that we will overcome. And we'll have great victory. And we're elated at the thought of a wonderful outcome. Because we think we have planned our lives and planned our search, uh, circumstances and situations that it couldn't be no other way but be glorious and be, you know, wonderful and prosperous. And we have that in our minds that that is what we want. And that's what we're going to receive. However, at other times we have a dread of failure. Has anybody ever gone into something afraid that you're going to fail, that you're not going to make it? I know I have at one time I was a person who uh, I would start something and about halfway through uh, the very thought of not being able to accomplish what I wanted to do caused me to stop doing it. And I would leave it right in the middle. Without really knowing what the outcome would be, I caused my own uh, self to uh, implode and not do what I knew was the right thing to do. A lot of times when we have that failure, it comes to the point that we have emotional and physical pain and suffering. A lot of times we think it's just emotional, but a lot of times, you know, stress is a killer. There's times when stress will cause you uh, stomach problems, you can't eat, you, uh, 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 insomnia, you can't sleep. Uh, 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 aches and pains, headaches, you know, so many things are so tied up in stress and that stress is there because you or we don't know how to allow God to be the leader of our lives. We do things that we want to do and when they don't come out the way we want them to, or they don't start out the way we want them to, or just like I had done in the middle of a situation, things start to go kind of hinky, then we start worrying and we start trying to figure out a best scenario in order to make it work. Problem is, is we don't know what our purpose is. And that is one of the things that we need to do is know what our purpose is. Um, God has blessed me to be able to write uh, a lot of inspirational things. And then we, we, we try to put the inspirations in your, um, 
in your bulletin. So it behooves you to read your bulletin this week because it's all about a journey. You know, we start out our lives without really knowing where we're going. I'm not talking about starting our lives as a child, because when you're a child, you don't have a thought of where you're going anyway. I'm talking about even as adults, we start projects or we start things that we think what we want to do, and we start charting ourselves. We start, you know, to, 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 to build up our own self in the things we want without really regards to, is this what God wants? Is this the purpose that God has for us? And we convince ourselves or try to convince ourselves that it's really God's doing when actuality is us. And when things don't work out the way that they should work out, then we try to force God into a situation. Oh, come on. Yeah, anybody ever done that? You know, it must be God's will, and I know it's God's will, and we're going to do it because I know it. And God ain't really in it. Because you don't know your purpose. Amen. See, not knowing, come on. This thing doesn't want to act right. There we go. <laughs> not knowing our purpose in life and ministry can cause daily challenges to become extremely heavy. And in some cases, stop us from achieving the things that God has stored up for us. We live our lives in a lot of heaviness sometimes. We, don't, we want to have you know, our burdens to be lightened, but because we don't know what God has for us or this is what's really going to get you. You know what God wants for you, but you don't want that. Oh, come on. God wants something specific for you, but you feel, well, that ain't right. That ain't what I want. So since it ain't what I want, I ain't going to do it. Oh, come on. Am I the only one that's had that happen to me? Took me 15 years to start a church. Because it wasn't what I wanted. But it stops us from achieving a lot of the things that God has already had stored up for us to receive. We delay our own progress. It's not about what God wants. See, Jeremiah 29, 11, this is, this is my favorite. I know I say that all the time. This is not only my favorite, this is one of my anchors. And it says, for I, this is God speaking to Jeremiah. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and the future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. When you read this, it doesn't say my plans are your plans. These are my plans for you. And my plans for you are so perfect that they will never harm you. They'll only give you nothing. Not only will they not harm you, they're going to give you hope and they're going to give you a prosperous future. But you got to do it God's way and not your way. Amen. This is his purpose for you. But he's wanting you to understand what he's planning for you. When you understand that, then you know you can go to God and ask God anything because you're going with the heart that says, Father, your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. God has always had a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. The plan and purpose he has for me is going to be different from what he has for you. That's the problem that a lot of us face. We want to act on somebody else's plan. You know, you, you done done this and it looks good to you, so that's what I want for me. And that's not your plan. Just because somebody else has a Mercedes Benz doesn't mean you're going to get a Mercedes Benz. I told y'all before, my favorite car at the time of growing up was a Cadillac Eldorado. 
Man, it wasn't nothing like El Dorado. It seemed like everywhere I looked, I saw El Dorado. Friends drove El Dorados. People at church had El Dorados. I never got an El Dorado. That wasn't God's plan and purpose for me. And once I realized that, I stopped seeing El Dorado. As a matter of fact, I don't even know if they still make them anymore. But I just, you know, I started to learn how to rely upon God's plan and God's purpose. And he's always been there and has never failed. Because I've learned how to listen to him and not me. You got to know God's plan for your individual life. Only then will you be able to live your purpose. How many of us, and this is just rhetorical, you don't have to answer. You don't have to raise your hand or nothing. But how many, of us, how many of us really know our purpose in God? Some people think, well, it's just to come to church and hear the word and go home and be a nice person. Be kind to people. You know, pet the dog. <laughs> Do those nice things in life that causes everybody to say, my, oh, my, what a good person you are. That's not a purpose. That's just a feeling. But do you really know what God has designed for you? I say it all the time. There's a general will for the body of Christ. Everybody's supposed to do this. Everybody. But he's got a specific will that's got your name on it. It's just for you and only you and nobody else can do it. And you've got to do it because it got your name on it. Amen. And he wants you to fulfill that purpose. And if you don't know what it is, it's high time that you began to spend some time with God and let him show you what he wants you to do. Me as a pastor, I can ask you to do all kinds of things. And that's wonderful if you do them. If you don't do them, hey, it's not a big issue. God's going purpose is going to be done no matter what. But you need to know what has God designed for you. And once you really know God's purpose for your life, then you can begin to become so much more at ease in working for God's kingdom. You're not working for the church, you're working for God. You're not working for your employer. Uh-oh. Now you can start getting into my pocket. <laughs> you're not... You, you may think you work for AT&T or maybe think you work for the state of Ohio or you know, wherever you work. Actually, you're working for God as a child of God because you work as unto him. He's the one that gives promotion. He's the one that gives you favor. He's the one that makes sure that every day you have the opportunity to succeed in all that you do. And if you're not doing it for him, you're not going to be successful in anything that you put your hand to. Now, all down through the Word of God, we've been given examples of individuals who have acknowledged their purpose in God's plan. So we're going to take a look at some of them. See, Abraham became the father of many nations. But the first thing he had to do was acknowledge and believe that God had called him and ordained his journey. Now, if God were to come and tell you, I'm going to make your name so great amongst the earth, and you're going to have so much offspring that it won't be able to be counted on a computer or anywhere else, what would you think? Well, some people say, I don't want one kid, let alone a thousand. <laughs> Come on. And I'm, I'm, I'm so introverted, I don't want nobody to even know my name. So God had to convince Abraham. And Abraham had to acknowledge God's word and God's voice in order for him to do what God had told him to do. So in Genesis 12, 1-8, we read that the Lord had said to Abram, 
Leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran, and headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the Oak of Morah. At that time, the area was inhabited by Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. After that, Abram traveled south and set up camp in the hill country with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built another altar and dedicated it to the Lord and worshipped the Lord. Moses also had a plan that God had given to him. But it began with his birth. So a lot of times we don't know. Um, we had an opportunity to talk with uh, some people. And my son and I, we were talking with a, a woman who had uh, adopted a child. And in adopting this child, um, she made it her life uh, journey and plan to make sure that this child knew his family that he came from. Now, a lot of times when you adopt a child, most adopted parents, they don't want nobody to know that they, you know, child had nothing. They, they want to be the sole parent. I'm the sole mother. I'm the sole father. We, 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 you know, we don't want you to go searching for your, for your family. But this woman wanted to make sure that this child knew his origin. So from almost birth, it was designed that although this woman loved him and cared for him and adopted him, he had opportunity to know where his lineage was. So even from birth, Moses had an opportunity being adopted and cared for by Pharaoh's daughter. He was still nursed by his mother, who was a child of Israel. Bible doesn't say it, but other writings do show that he knew who he was all the time he was growing up. Even though he was housed in Pharaoh's house, he knew he was not an Egyptian. Because his lineage and his DNA and everything about him told him this is who he was. So we see in Exodus 3, 1 through 10. It says, one day as Moses tended the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, before we get to, remember, um, the reason why Moses was no longer up under the care of Pharaoh and his household, because one day he saw the Egyptians striking one of his fellow Jews. And he took it upon himself to stop that abuse, and he killed the man. Now, in doing that, there was only one sentence for Moses, and that was death. So Moses fled. So here we see him now, after he has already fled, he's now married, and he's tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, out of the edge of the desert near Horeb the mountain of God. Suddenly the angel of Jehovah appeared to him as a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw that the bush was on fire and that it didn't burn up, he went over to investigate. Then God called out to him, Moses, Moses. Who is it? Moses asked. Don't come any closer, God told him. Take off your shoes for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Moses covered his face with his hand, for he was afraid to look at God. 
Then the Lord told him, I have seen the deep sorrows of my people in Egypt and have heard their pleas for freedom from their harsh taskmasters. I have come to deliver them from the Egyptians and to take them out of Egypt into a good land, a large land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, uh, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites live. All them Ites brothers and cousins. <laughs> yes, the well of the people of Israel has risen to me in heaven, and I have seen the heavy tasks the Egyptians have oppressed with them with. Now I am going to send you to Pharaoh to demand that he lets you lead my people out of Egypt. Now, not only is he picking a man who, as you continue to read about Moses, he tells him, you know, I'm, I, I got a speech impediment, so I'm not the one you think I ought to do. God, you are exactly who I want. God's trying to tell each and every one of us. I don't care what your problem is. I don't care what your idiosyncrasies are. I don't care what your failures have been. I don't care how, how, how low you may have an esteem of yourself. You are exactly who God wants to use. Yes. All right. Yes. All right. Yes. Jesus did not go into the temple and get all the learned men to follow him. I always say he pulled every blue collar worker he could find. Thieves. Rebels, doubters, craftsmen, fishermen, unlearned men, broken pots, so he could mold them back together and make them into what he wanted them to be. Child of God, that's what God wants to do with you. That's what he did with Moses. And we see that Moses went ahead and led the children of Israel out of the hand of Pharaoh. God's plan for the world has always been to reconcile or restore men back to God through Jesus Christ. That is God's plan for mankind. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, it's been his plan to bring us back to him. To the death, burial, resurrection of his son Jesus Christ, this was to be accomplished. Jesus had to come as that broker for our salvation to get us back to that place in God where we could hear his voice, we could follow his direction, we could trust him to do the things he wants us to do. We, um, yesterday, we, um, we had a celebration for a man who loved God. Loved God. And I'm going to say it even more. God really loved this man. Amen. 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 God really loved this man. He is special. A lot of times we look at people who are special and we can't understand, you know, what is it about them? And I was talking with my brothers this morning as we were praying, and it was brought to my attention. And I never thought about it like that until I heard it this morning. He wasn't the special needs. We are the special needs. Amen. 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 God, God had him exactly where he wanted him. God spoke with him. He spoke with God. He had a relationship with God we couldn't understand, but he didn't have no problems. We got the problem. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. We got special needs. We are the ones that's trying to make it in. We are the ones that's running this race, and it's hard for us yes. when we get in the middle of a race that we get tired. God knows that man that he... <laughs> He, all I get over here, I'm saying, I hear him saying now. Jesus said, Charlie, you all right? Charlie go, yep. <laughs> Charlie, you home now? You you doing good? Yep. <laughs> that was Charlie. Yep. And I praise God for that example that I see. Because Jesus Christ, he came that we can be reconciled and restored back to God. His birth, his death, 
His resurrection, his burial, all of that was done for a specific purpose. And that's getting us to know who God is. Matthew 1, 20 to 21. says, But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from his sins. This is before he was even born. It was already predestined that he was going to save his people from their sins. Romans 5.15 says, and what a difference between man's sin and God's forgiveness. For this one man, Adam, brought death to many through his sin, but this one man, Jesus Christ, brought forgiveness to many through God's mercy. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. One man in the sin in all the world, but one man brought forgiveness to all of the world Amen. and more. And Hebrews 9, 13 to 15. I love this scripture. It says, with the old way of worship, the blood and ashes of animals could make men clean after they had sinned. How much more the blood of Christ will do? He gave himself as a perfect gift to God through the spirit that lives forever. Now your heart can be free from the guilty feeling of doing work that is worth nothing. Now you can work for the living God. Christ is the one who gave us this new way of worship. All those who have been called by God may receive life that lasts forever, just as he promised them. Christ bought us with his blood when he died for us. This made us free from our sins, which, he did, which we did under the old way of worship. That's awesome what Christ has done for us. We now have what is called the rights to the kingdom of God. All because of Christ's blood that was shed. Before you had to, once a year, you had to go and get your sins cleansed. You had to take something to the priest so he could offer the bull or offer the doves, burn them up. And as the ashes went up, your sins went away. And then you went back and you had a whole year that you could sin. <laughs> and come back the next year. Now it's instantaneous. Jesus. We know when we sin. You don't have to sin. Sin is a choice. When you sin, you have the ability now through the blood of Christ to immediately say, Father, forgive me, I have sinned. And immediately, you ain't got to wait a year. Immediately, your sins are forgiven. Thank you. Thank you. All because of the new plan God has for you. If we are to live our purpose, we need to know God's plan for our lives. Faith, trust, and obedience are keys to knowing his plan and purpose for our lives. Faith, trust, and obedience. We have peace in our lives through faith. We find this in Romans 5, 1 through 5. I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture, but that's what I do. In Romans 5, 1 through 5 says, So now since we have been made right in God's sight by faith in his promises, we can have real peace with him because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. For because of our faith, he has brought us into this place of highest privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to actually becoming all that God has had in mind for us to be. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they are good for us. They help us learn to be patient. And patience develops strength of character in us and helps us trust God more each time we use it until finally our hope and faith are strong and steady. My goodness, do you hear what God is saying to us? 
So then when that happens, we are able to hold our heads high, no matter what happens, and know that all is well, for we know how dearly God loves us, and we feel this warm love everywhere within us because God has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. You can't ask for nothing better than that. The knowing what God has done for you, the peace, the faith that you have that gives you what you need. That's that peace. I had my brother tell me one time, he said, Malcolm, all I want is peace. He had some, some trials and some tribulations and things that he was going through in life, and he had money, he had a nice car, he had a nice house, he, you know, good job, all that stuff that a lot of us, we think is what's going to make us happy. But he said, all I want is peace. Well, you get that through faith in Christ. Then you have your direction through trust. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I like how it says it in the Amplified Bible. It says, trust and rely confidently in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. In all your ways, know and acknowledge and recognize him. And he will make your path straight and smooth, removing obstacles that block your way. Mm. You got to rely confidently on the Lord. You got to put your trust and your faith in him for everything you do. You have to acknowledge that everything, oh, I hear you, oh, they, they, they ain't going to like this, Lord, but it's okay. Good or bad that happens to you, you got to acknowledge God's hand is in it. Amen. 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 Oh, yeah, all the good, yeah. But what about the bad? He already told you that sometimes those trials make you patient. Mm -hmm. They serve their purpose in you. Even the bad stuff, even the hard stuff, even the things that seem like it's unbearable, even those things are for a reason and a purpose that makes you stronger in life. Because yeah. you got to live. It'd be wonderful as soon as you got saved if God whisked you off to heaven. Mm. That ain't how it works. <laughs> you got a job to do here on the earth. Yes. You have a life you have to live here on the earth. And you need God to help you every single day through every single situation and circumstance. So you might as well just trust in him and rely upon him to lead you and guide you in the way that you should go. And then we have victory through obedience. How many of us want victory? I don't want to be defeated. I want to be victorious over everything that happens. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6 in the New Living Translation says, We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. And after you have become fully obedient, uh oh, after you have become fully obedient, after you have become fully obedient, then we will punish everyone who remains disobedient. The scripture that says, How can you get the speck out of your brother's eye when you got a log in yours? He tells you to first get that log out of your own eye. Then you can help your brother get the speck out of his. That's in essence what this is saying. Once you become fully obedient to God, then you can help others learn how to become obedient to God. They follow your example. You don't stand on a soapbox. You don't jump up and down and wear that cross that goes from the chin to the knee and carry the coffee table Bible around with a big C on your chest, super Christian. <laughs> you let the light of God shine through you that others may see God's good works in you. Then they can glorify the Father which is in heaven. 
One of God's plans for you is prosperity and a healthy life. 3 John, verse 2. It says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. God's got many things in store for us. Prosperity is more than money. People think it's all about money. I know some people that don't have what they call two nickels to rub together. But they are so prosperous in health and so prosperous in joy and so prosperous in God's love. We put one, we sent one home yesterday who had just that. A lot of prosperity and love. People he knew, people that knew him. That's prosperity right there. Amen. You don't need two nickels to rub together. As long as you got God. Yes. Once we know our purpose in God, we can have confidence in his plan. We can go forward boldly. Knowing that what we place in his hands, he's taking care of it. And that when we are obedient to follow his word, daily challenges now become much easier to sustain. Much easier to go through. We know that God is with us. He's already given a promise that he would never leave us nor forsake us. Then and only then will we know we can be victorious over every situation and every circumstance that we find ourselves in. Live your purpose in God today. Don't let the enemy try to keep you from knowing what God wants you to do. Don't let him put those words in your ears that make you think that it's all about you because it ain't about you. It's all about God. The ministry is tough enough for us to have to go through when we're trying to think more about how people see us and what they think about us. It ain't about us. This is not the gospel according to Malcolm. It's all about God. And when we learn to know that God is the one who helps us make it through every situation and we listen for his voice to direct us in the way we will go, then you know your plan. Then you can live your purpose Amen. in God every single day. Amen. 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 I want to thank you for watching this video. I pray that you were blessed by it, that it encourages you to have a deeper relationship with God, that you continue to fight the good fight of faith and grow strong and courageous in your daily battles with the enemy. I encourage you to subscribe to our page, like us on Facebook, and log on to our website. There you can submit a prayer request and support this ministry through a financial gift. And remember, if each one can reach one, and a reached one can reach one, then a one one will have one one, and the kingdom will have been advanced one soul at a time. Thank you and have a great day.